Well, the group that I think will get something out of this tape um, probably are a group of people that have had have bought a system, uh, basic television, one camera, one microphone system, and who've tried it and who've played with it, who read all the stuff that's in the book and tried to make it work and have probably tried to do a program and uh, for one reason or another really weren't satisfied with what they did. So the four things we're going to talk about, I wrote them down so I'd be prepared, are uh, sound, uh, camera movement, and, and uh, camera mounts, you know, however you support the camera, lenses, and lighting. So let's start with, uh, let's start with audio. And I think the reason we're going to start with audio is quite simple. Uh, I really believe that audio is almost more important than pictures, really. People, when they watch a tape, are more apt to accept something wrong in the picture track than they are to accept something wrong in the audio track. If the audio has got buzz in it, or it's unintelligible, or it's mushy, or it's edited and funny, you know, in between words, that causes people to straighten up and say, ha, huh, something's wrong. You know, they, they instantaneously seem to know that. They don't always know what it is, but they know something was wrong, and they react to it subconsciously. Uh, so I think it's really crucial, uh, one of the most important things that needs to happen is that the tape have good, clear, intelligible audio. Okay, how do you do that? Well, obviously the answer is the same as it is in all the areas that we're going to talk about. You use the most simple approach you can. And we have limited you here to one microphone, because I think that in most of the cases, like 90% of the times you go to record something, one microphone will, will work just fine. Now, the reason for that is simply because as you go beyond it, your problems increase almost logarithmically. I mean, you have two microphones or three microphones. That means you need a mixer. If you have a mixer, then you have to have somebody to operate it. That person has to know what, what they're doing, uh, has to have a headset of reasonable good quality or a speaker system or something so they can hear the audio so they can make judgmental decisions about which one should be louder and which one should fade up and down. So if you, if you use just one microphone and you're editing, uh, it's a lot easier. And then, it sounds like you got a lot of different microphones later on because you've edited all these things together. Well, most of the less expensive uh, battery-operated port-a-pack type systems come with the microphone already in the system. It's usually built into the camera, or in some cases it's mounted up on top of the camera. And uh, we've found that uh, that microphone, particularly the later ones, are, it's a pretty good microphone, a number of things it'll do quite well. Uh, for example, I mean, if you're listening to crowd noise or you're out in a group of people or there's a conversation going on and you just want to hear the fact that there's something happening there. classroom and you want to hear kid noise you know the, the rustle of papers and people running up and, and yelling and screaming and shouting or whatever they do but you don't necessarily want to hear everything word for word that microphone works quite well the reason it doesn't work any better than that in terms of listening to specific noise is that it's generally just too far away from whatever the noise is assuming what's coming out of my mouth right now is noise uh, then what you've got to do if you want to understand that is put a microphone like this one is right here, uh, right in front of the, the noise or, or my voice. It could be a musical instrument. Or it could be a sound effect. So what you want to do then is have an external microphone. Plug it into the recorder. Usually there's a place. And then you want to put it near the source of the sound. Okay, one of the other keys, or one of the other ways that uh, I think you can make sure that you get good sound is to listen to it while you're recording it. Uh, if you don't listen to it, if you just kind of do it on the fly and say, well, it'll be all right, uh, then you don't really know what you're getting until you go to play the tape back. And usually, if something was spontaneous particularly, that, uh, that's too late, uh, it's gone, and it's useless. Uh, so what you should do, I think, is go out and buy a headset. 
Uh, most of the systems come with these little button things you plug in your ear, and, and you can use those to see if there's sound there. I mean, I've been able to hear to that level. But if you really want to hear the sound, you want to know what it's really like, you should go out and buy a little bit more expensive two-eared headset. And there are, you know, there are all kinds of them. They're great, big, huge stereophonic headsets that uh, cost like $60 a piece. And they're, you know, they're good if you can afford them. But there are less expensive ones. There are one down under $10 that uh, will do quite well. And it give you a, a clearer understanding of the sound that you're recording and a knowledge that when you go to edit the tape, you're going to have something usable. One other thing I think you should buy is a good microphone. Uh, one that, uh, uh, like this one is, that's shock mounted, that you can, you can bump or move or hit or lift out of its case like this and move back, that doesn't uh, cause the sound to be so distorted that it's unusable. You should get a mic that has a, one of these TV finishes on it. This has a dull finish. It's not very bright and shiny. Uh, the other thing I think you should have is a nice long cord, and it wouldn't hurt to have one of, you know, 30 feet or longer so that you can Get, actually get the microphone uh, you know, quite a ways away from the recorder and up close to the source of the sound. So what have we said? We've said that uh, you should use a simple approach, one microphone. Uh, if you're going for crowd noise or, or noise that you don't really have to uh, be critical about, uh, that you can use the internal microphone in the camera. If you're going for sound or voice that's critical and you have to understand it, that you use one microphone and it to be close to the source of the sound, very close, uh, that you get some way to listen to the sound as it's being recorded, probably a headset, and that you buy a good microphone. The next area that we're going to talk about is camera movement and camera mounts. And I think the, the most important thing that you should know about that is that you really shouldn't move the camera unless you absolutely have to move the camera, unless there's something in the, in the picture that moves and you have to go with it or there's some major motivation for a move. Uh, otherwise, you shouldn't move it. You should hold it as still as you can. Well, the easiest way to hold the camera still is to mount it on a tripod. That's probably the best way. And if you listen to Bucky Fuller, it's the best way because the tripod basically is a bunch of triangles put together. What it really is is a tetrahedron. It's like a pyramid. And it's the most structurally sound thing there is. So that up at the top of this tetrahedron, there is what we call a head. Uh, the head is the thing that allows the camera to actually move, to pan back and forth or tilt up and down. Uh, the key to success is in the quality of the head that you buy. Uh, there are basically three types that I know of. There's a little photographer's head called a universal head, which you can buy, which costs a couple of bucks, uh, which is a neat head if the camera doesn't have to move. It has a little lockdown screw on it, and when you unscrew it, the camera just kind of falls. But the second level of head is, is the kind that you probably got with your system. Uh, it's a head that has two lockdown screws on it. But in both cases, when you undo them, they're very loose and they don't really allow you to move the camera very, very smoothly. Uh, the best kind of head, though, at least the one that we, we use and we really like, are heads that are called fluid heads. They have oil in them, and when you undo the lock screw goody on it, it doesn't just fall, it kind of floats through space as it falls. And that would allow you to hold it still. And you can be very smooth with it. Uh, almost anybody can be smooth with it. Even I can be smooth with it. Uh, they're not cheap. and they, they cost upwards of $400. But again, if you're really into it and you want to do a good job, beg, borrow, or steal a, uh, a fluid. Now, you can mount the head on any kind of a tripod you want. We've found that we generally have two. We have a regular one that's nominally three, three and a half feet off the ground. And it's adjustable. It'll go upwards of seven feet if you ever have to. And then we built up one, which uh, uh, this one is actually uh, built off an old surveyor's tripod that we cut the legs off. It was one that came to us cheap, and uh, we just sawed it off and kind of rebuilt it. But it's, uh, it's very advantageous for us because it allows us, if, for example, if we have to do any work with kids, we can get down to their eye view. We can see things from their point of view rather than looking down on them. Um, yeah, I think it's good to have you know, a couple of different heights available, and uh, one of them should allow you to get it pretty darn close to the ground. The other thing that you can do to mount the camera, obviously, is just hold it. And I think that's the one that occurs to most everybody right away, uh, handheld work. Handheld work, although it's, you know, it's easy to do, is very difficult to do well. And there are a couple things you should know about it if you go do it. I think the first thing that you should know, I mean, it's almost a hard, fast rule. I, I'm, I'm hard pressed to, to lay rules on you, but I, I don't ever break this one. 
don't zoom in with your zoom lens. If you have a zoom lens on your camera and you go to do handheld work, zoom it all the way out wide and leave it out wide. Um, physically what happens is as you zoom the lens in, uh, the amount of shake in your arms and body and whatever is magnified. Uh, and shake is something that you don't want. So zoom it out wide and leave it out wide. Uh, now you, you obviously, well I need a close up. I want to get in on some guy's face. He's talking away. I don't just want to see him from the feet all the way up to his head. I want to play something tighter. Well that's okay. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Just don't zoom the camera. Just walk in. Leave the lens out wide. The wider the lens, the easier it is to handhold. When you come to a situation where you have to handhold it, and you have to hold it for longer than just a couple of seconds, um, make life as easy for yourself as you can. Uh, if you've got a, a battery-operated recorder and you're carrying it on your shoulder, set it down on the ground, uh, you know, and use the camera cable uh, to allow you to handhold it. Don't don't carry the additional weight of the recorder and the camera. Uh, try to find something to prop yourself up against. Uh, even if you're the most stable person in the world, uh, you're going to get tired pretty darn quick. And, uh, and just try to avoid a situation where you know you're going to handhold it for 10 minutes because you're going to die at about five minutes. You can, you can handhold five or six very short sequences and then edit them together later uh, a lot easier than you can if you have to record a 10-minute thing continuously. The next area that we're going to talk about is lenses. And really there isn't a lot to say about lenses other than the one that you got with your camera, the, the zoom lens, probably won't do all the things that you really wished it would do. And you could buy all kinds of lenses and never really have enough of them, but uh, when it comes to considering an alternative, there's, there is maybe possibly one that, that really would be of value, and that I think is a wide angle lens. Uh, most of the zoom lenses just don't zoom out wide enough and uh, you can't really get enough into them and there are some real advantages to wide angle lenses. Uh, first of all, you get a, uh, I, I think you can get more information into a, to a scene and a lot of times that, that's, that's really helpful. Other reasons why zoom, uh, wide angle lenses uh, you know, are nice to have or a good wide angle lens is nice to have is that, uh, for example, there's, there's less focus problems with it. You can focus closer to something or, and farther away and its resolution is better. That is, it, you know, it, it makes a finer picture. Uh, you can use it to take close-ups. Normally, you don't think of taking close-ups with a wide-angle lens. You think of doing that with a, you know, a longer lens or a telephoto lens or the zoom lens zoomed all the way and you zoom it in for the close-up. But in reality, uh, if, you use, if you're editing up something and you can take the close-ups, like if you were doing a demonstration, well, well we did on one other tape on editing. Um, you want to take a close-up of the machine, you want to see all the knobs and buttons. Uh, we did all those close-ups with a wide-angle lens and there was some real advantage to us there because uh, in addition to just seeing the little knob that we were talking about, up nice and close and big in the screen, you could, you could see a lot of it. You could see where the knob was in relation to the rest of the machine and you could see the whole hand that was adjusting it and it just makes for a better shot. Uh, granted, there's some distortion. I mean, all wide-angle lenses have some optical distortions in them and the one thing that you can't do with them or that you shouldn't do with them or you can do it if you want is to take a picture of somebody's face if you get up very close to him uh, it tends to uh, play fun and games with their nose usually it uh, makes it much bigger than it really is or makes it look to be bigger let me go back to the zoom lens for just a second uh, the couple of things you should know there is that the zoom lenses are hard to focus uh, you know it isn't automatic that it stays in focus as you zoom it you gotta set it the way you set it is to zoom it all the way in on whatever it is you're going to zoom in on and focus it. You focus the lens and then when you zoom it back out it should stay. Some cameras have uh, what they call a back focus adjustment and when you zoom it back out then you've got to adjust that back focus. Uh, but once you do that it should stay in focus. As long as your uh, subject, whatever it is that you've zoomed in on, doesn't move to and from the camera. The subject can move left and right as long as the distance away from the camera doesn't or up and down, but as long as that distance doesn't change. And if you want everything to look, you know, together, then, and then you want to know where that point is and change the focus so that when you zoom in, it'll stay in focus. It's not really all that desirable to have it drifting in and out all the time. It looks very rough and ragged. The last thing that we're going to talk about is lighting. And lighting is something that we've, uh, we've been playing with for quite some time, and we've, we've, I think, pretty much now realized that Almost every situation that we ever have to photograph, uh, anywhere, indoors or outdoors or, you know, in a small place like this or in a large room or whatever, every situation that we light, we start with a basic approach to lighting. 
and and we always start that way, and we you know, depending on the situation and the variables, and we compromise it. Um, the situation assumes a couple of constants. First of all, that the the subject being lit is one subject or relatively one subject, either one person, uh, you know, or one box or thing or machine or whatever it's being photographed. I think the other thing we have to assume is that uh, that you're lighting something, nominally a face that's a standard kind of thing. You got to make the face look right, as opposed to a wide shot of a room or a blank wall or a wall that has bulletin boards or something on it. You know. Uh, okay, so those are the qualifications. Uh, we approach it this way. First of all, we generally light it with three lights. Uh, we place one light very close to the camera, and then we try to draw a triangle. And we assume that the camera and that light are one point of the triangle, uh, that I am in the center of the triangle, and that the triangle is equilateral. You know, it's equally sided. Uh, at the other two points, then, we place two more lights, and uh, we follow the pretty classic terminology. We call the light by the camera key light, and we call the other two lights backlights or side lights. Uh, what these two lights do uh, are to light up uh, the edge of the subject, to separate the subject from the background, whatever it is, a wall or a fence or nothing or you know something. But the point is that they, they provide an edge or a rim light on the shoulders and on the head and the neck and all around. Uh, that gives the picture kind of a little visual snap, and it, it keeps it from looking flat and dull. Uh, the light by the camera obviously lights up the face. Uh, it gets rid of shadows under the eyes and makes the face look like a face. Uh, it, granted, it creates some shadows. There should be some shadows down underneath the chin and little ones under the nose. But they're not long, deep, protruding shadows, and they're not uh, very um, mystery movie type, you know, Dracula lighting, there, that it looks like a face should look, it looks, you know, looks right. Okay, so I look through my, uh, my viewfinder, and I don't turn any lights on, everything looks fine. To which I say, fine, go ahead and shoot, don't use the lights. I mean, you don't need lights in every situation. You don't have to set up all three lights all the time. Uh, you know, you're only setting them up when you need them. Um, if uh, you're just shooting scenes, for example, and they're all relatively wide scenes, you know, and all you need is just enough light to make exposure, uh, if there's enough fluorescent light in the room to do it, do it. But if you zoom into somebody's face and you try to look at it under the fluorescent lights and all of a sudden, you know, the eyes are all deep set and, and it just generally looks washed out and flat and, and, and kind of drab, uh, then you start thinking towards some light. And you start thinking towards the three light system. What are some of the other compromises? Well, one of the ones are obvious is that uh, the particular situation you're in already has light coming from one of these three points. Uh, you may have a window over here, and it may be very bright outside today. Uh, today, it doesn't happen to be here, but I mean, it, 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 if it were, that could be one of those lights. That could be lighting up this side of the person, see? So then you could buy with two lights. You just have the key and the other backlight. Um, if you're outside, uh, one of the lights could be the sun. Um, that's a kind of a, you know, it'll work. It'll work reasonably well if you can control it, but it's pretty hard to tell the sun where to go. So what you end up doing is moving yourself around so that the sun either becomes the key light or becomes the backlight. Probably better that it become the key light for you because you can do without the, this edge lighting. Uh, if it's an overcast day, then you're in because then, you know, the light is evenly distributed. Although, uh, most of the time on an overcast day, you need to take a little light and put it in the person's face and then let the diffuse light be the other two light sources. Um, if you're back in the room and you've got a window, uh, one of the things that you probably shouldn't do is try to use the window as both backlights. I mean, don't don't shoot so the window is right behind you. And the reason for that is because the camera generally will ex you know, adjust itself to the brightest light. And if the window is brighter than the person that's in front of the window, then the window is going to, you know, camera will adjust for that and this person will silhouette. And unless you really want that, uh, that's not a good thing to do. You should turn yourself around so that the window becomes the key light and the wall that doesn't have any light on it uh, is behind the person. The lights that you use are, you know, whatever you got. I suppose the easiest thing to do is go find somebody's old movie lights and use them. Uh, or if you got some stage theater lights, they're generally pretty bulky and oftentimes they're hard to plug in because they have funny plugs on them. But if you can do that, if you can work out the adapters and the like, use them, use them. It's whatever you got. 
Uh, we happen to use uh, one of these little suitcase kits that uh, there are several lighting companies make that uh, cost a couple hundred dollars. And uh, they normally have three or four lights in them. You can, you know, look at their catalogs and find all kinds of different versions in them. But they're, uh, I think they're 650 watt lamps. They're not very big ones. They're not, you know, uh, they're not very hot. They're not very heavy. They're light and they're portable and they're easily set up and uh, uh, they're easily plugged into the wall anywhere and we rarely blow any fuses with them because, I mean, all together they just don't draw that much power. Um, use what you got.